Villains come in various forms. The obvious ones shouldn't surprise you, but many times those least obvious are the most harmful, as they twist the very fabric of reality hoping they will somehow get away with their actions. Yet every once in a while, one tries to redeem their mistakes by saving what can still be saved from a broken soul. And when you experience either of these scenarios in video games, designers directly play with your emotions, such as empathy and hatred. That's captivating. However, keeping the story credible? That's hard. But lucky us, there are a couple of games we can explore for a solution. In the Call of Duty Modern Warfare series, the very nature of the game requires a good story and well-defined characters. Obviously, the player will have to face villains as tough as nails. Vladimir Makarov is the best example of a pure-blooded villain. Just to be clear, not only an antagonist, but a real villain. A former military and ex -Petsnaz. he seems to be an exalted ultra-nationalist who aims to restore Mother Russia and its autocratic might. But this doesn't mean that he is driven by real political beliefs. His game is only about power and holding it. In fact, he is just a callous, brutal killer, fueled by an all-evil energy. Robberies, assassinations, aircraft hijackings, attacks on soldiers and foreign diplomats, weapons, drugs and people trafficking, bombings… is there anything else? Oh yeah, kidnappings too. Makarov uses every means to make his intentions and power known, without hiding behind morality or principles. The innocents may be used to control a situation, anyone can be hurt or killed, and of course, those who don't embrace his mindset and actions, well… <laughs> During a military conflict in the Middle East, Makarov gives the order to detonate a nuclear load. The result? More than 30,000 American Marines die. Thousands of souls extinguished by the push of a button. After Imran Zakaev, his mentor, is eliminated by Captain John Price and his team, Makarov becomes the leader of a strong jingoistic organization and sets revenge as the main objective for himself. Slaughtering innocent Russian civilians on Zakaev International Airport and framing the Americans for this atrocity shows us how delusional Makarov was in his hypocrisy. Everyone is a target, and if that implies war with everyone, then that will happen. His kind of war has no rules. The enemy deserves no mercy. Nothing is off limits. To quote General Shepard, Makarov has no loyalty. There's no country or flag or ideology involved. He just trades blood for money. But don't mistake Makarov for a maniac with plenty of weapons at his fingertips. No, this is not the case. Makarov is a clever criminal a strategist with a clear military mind, trained to develop complex plans that place him one step ahead of those who chase after him. In fact, Makarov's opinion about how easy a war can start is quite fit and has a certain philosophical load. It doesn't take the most powerful nations on earth to create the next global conflict. Just the will. Of a single man. In spite of his intelligence, he becomes prideful and leaves his guard down, being sure he couldn't be found. As we already know, nobody is perfect, meaning Makarov isn't either. I guess you already know how this story ends. The next antagonist is created with all, well, almost all, the features of a hero, General Shepard. Although I admit it's tempting, I will not speculate about his name. Maybe because, in the end, it looked like they set a wolf to guard the ship. Yeah, I know, lame joke. I'll try a better one next time. Shepard is a top-ranking officer of the US Army, made of that special fabric used to forge tough guys. You don't see him too many times, but his presence can't be disregarded. Part of his job is to give orders, and apparently that's something he's good at. Someone turn off that damn TV. Certainly, Lance Henriksen's voice is a plus. Shepard's backstory is not very detailed, but we find that he was the commander of more than 30,000 soldiers who were the victims of the nuclear explosion ordered by Makarov. Maybe that's how Makarov used to make new friends. We can assume that Shepard was one of those truly committed officers to whom the soldiers were not merely an amorphous mess of maneuver. He felt responsible for them. 
And perhaps, even if Makarov no longer respected the rules of war, Shepard couldn't accept that the madness of a single individual could be the cause of the loss of so many lives. But the lack of empathy on the whole world, for which that incident was just ink stains on a newspaper page, turned all this drama into something more personal for Shepard. Several years after the incident, the general is the commander of the US Army Rangers in Afghanistan. Makarov is hunted, but with no noticeable results. The US military power seems to have faded away. Taking advantage of this, Makarov executes a terrorist attack on Zakaev airport, making it appear to have been a US operation. From here to the invasion of the United States by Russia is just one step. It's not surprising that Shepard is the one appointed to lead a defense against the assault. This position of strength gives him the opportunity to command the US Marine Corps, US Army Rangers, Task Force 1 for 1, and even his exclusive troops, the Shadow Company. The general is a real soldier with an impressive professional stature, hence he gets a blank check in order to defend America and capture Makarov. General Shepard, you warned us, we should have listened. One man is responsible for all this. Makarov must be brought to light. Whatever you need, General, you've got a blank check. Except that Shepard sees the situation in a very different light. The death of his soldiers has been almost forgotten. Shepard wants his revenge, not only on Makarov for his cruelty, but on a society that proved unable, at any level, to learn anything from the past. Five years ago, I lost 30,000 men in the blink of an eye. And the world just watched. Now, they were all back to square one, defending themselves against the sham attacks of a willful madman. Because Makarov was right. To topple the world, you don't need much. Since no one is taking radical measures to stop Makarov, the general schemes something huge. To trigger World War III. The implications are frightening, and once started, the plan becomes an unstoppable nightmare. But the player is unaware. From their perspective, Shepard is the character the game needs as a pivotal point. He is the one who can send the action in the logical direction. Well, all fine and dandy until... We have the DSF. We've got it, sir! Good. That's one less loose end. No! And something like that tends to ruin your day. It is only now that the player understands the magnitude of this seat they were subjected to. Because it was all part of Shepard's plan, inserting a double agent into Makarov's organization, deliberately exposing this agent so that the blame for the massacre on the airport falls on the Americans, the preparation of defense against Russian invasion, tying up the loose ends, hunting down Makarov, and finally, strengthening his image of a glorious war hero. Tomorrow, there will be no shortage of volunteers, no shortage of patriots. The general was a busy little bee. At least the player has the chance to end Shepard's prodigious career in a way, let's call it suitable. Fierce, yet suitable. say about revenge, you'd better be ready to dig two graves. The story from Dishonored has a pretty intricate structure, which allows the protagonist to interact with many different antagonists, leaders of criminal gangs, some weirdos, or politicians and high-ranking military thirsty for power. What a surprise. They and their henchmen will hunt, poison, betray, or kill you just because they want something and somehow you are in their way. Quite trite, yet they are needed pieces of the story. A couple of them stand out, because they are the ones who start the conflict and keep the players on their toes for a long time. The first one, Hiram Burrows, the royal spymaster and, later, the Lord Regent. He is an unlikable character, an elitist with narcissistic accents, scoring the poor, seeing spies and traitors everywhere, making up threats actually being the victim of an obsessive need for order. Apparently, the craving for power theme again, but on a heavier note. After the first half of the game, you realize what his true purpose was. Through a recording that once broadcasted, non-lethally neutralizes him. 
And it was a simple plan. Bring the disease-bearing rats from the Pandician continent and let them take care of the poor for us. I knew the truth would come out eventually. She had to die, you see. She had to die. Bringing about the death of an empress is not an easy thing. This is Barrow's confession about his leading role in a malefic plan to rid Danwell of poor people through a plague carried by the rats from the Pandician continent, except the disease got out of control and everyone was exposed to it. The Empress's attempt to solve the crisis posed a threat to the royal spymaster, so he decides to assassinate her. However, it's not Barrows who carries out the plan, but Daud, the master assassin. After her death, Barrows assumes the role of Lord Regent and takes the reins of the Empire. And so, a character who had been rather dull until that moment gets an overwhelming weight in the dynamics of the game, being practically the trigger of the whole conflict. But more interesting than the brain is the tool, no other than Daud, a complex figure. As an antagonist, he has a strong and questionable backstory. Rumored to be the son of a witch, Daud was a young man resolved to build a name for himself. If that fame was to be based on fear and blood, it didn't seem to bother him. Live by the sword, die by the sword. After being branded by the outsider, a mysterious supernatural being, Daud became a fully skilled assassin with magical powers. He then gathered the Wailers, a shadowy band of ex-mercenaries, street kids and refugees, and made them accept his authority through discipline and a bit of black magic. Using his powers and skills, Daud established himself as a hitman for the aristocracy in Dunwall. Anybody might be a victim, he never made any difference, never had any doubt. It's not long before Barrows, the royal spymaster, begins to use the services of Daud and his gang. They are given the task of killing the Empress, Jessamine Caldwin, and kidnapping her daughter, Emily, as Barrows directly ordered. But on the chosen day, the presence of Corvo Atano, the royal protector, makes the plan almost fail. Daud is forced to step in, killing the Empress himself. From this moment on, the game is centered on the actions of Corvo, aimed at avenging the Empress's death and liberating Emily. During the game, Daud and Corvo have almost no interaction, but near the end, they meet one last time and engage in a sword fight. Before fighting the duel that no two others could fight, Daud can be heard talking to himself, having remorse about killing the Empress. How many people did I kill for you? None like the last. None like her. I'd give back all the coin if I could. No one should have to kill an empress. The fight ends without being defeated and having one last request. I have one more surprise for you. I asked for my life. When I killed your empress and took her daughter, something broke inside me. So the Stone Cold Daud knows exactly the difference between good and evil, and perfectly understands what the consequences of his deeds were, but his confession heals nothing of the harm done. The character turns out to be even more interesting from the perspective of the DLCs, where Daud is the protagonist. After killing the Empress, crushed by regret, Daud gets from the outsider one last gift, the name Delilah. Eventually, Daud's findings lead him to Delilah Copperspoon, a strange and vicious woman, a witch keen on painting and black magic, head of the Brigmore witches. Piecing together all the facts and details, Daud understands what Delilah is planning. This plot outweighs in danger and implications any other evil scheme Daud had taken part in. Delilah wants to steal Emily Caldwin's body and rule in her place as Empress using a powerful ritual. Guilty of the Empress's death, Daud cannot witness indifferently what might happen to Emily, so he eliminates Delilah during the ritual and saves the little girl, in a desperate attempt to soothe his own demons. It is only now that we understand Daud's true nature and why he asked Corvo to leave him alive. Killing for money had never been a problem for Daud, all the more so since the victims were not the cleanest people. But killing an innocent for reasons unknown to him and kidnapping a child only for some dirty ploys of others, those were the final straw. For him, saving the girl is a sort of a last attempt to prove that, beyond the atrocities committed, he succeeded to redeem at least a bit of his soul. One more job shouldn't have mattered. Thank you for watching. In the next and final episode of this series on writing video game villains, we'll look at 5 unusual but highly captivating villains who are drastically different 
from what we've seen so far. However, if you can't wait until then, understandably so, support the show by becoming a patron and joining all these wonderfully immoral villains. Avirama FM, Badr al Kahtani, Bello23, Debashish Patra, Giovanni Pena, Golden Glowmaster, Rahul Mahipal, Realitats Verlast, and Waifu is Laifu. I'll see you in the next episode.